Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, See When Your AAV Can't Stand the Heat with UNCLE. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Unchained Labs. To learn more, please visit unchainedlabs.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Kevin Lance, Director of Analytics Marketing at Unchained Labs. Kevin, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome to my talk, See When Your AAV Can't Stand the Heat with UNCLE. Unchained Labs has been helping out with our gene therapy squad for all kinds of problems and all kinds of gene therapy tech. We've been honing our tools to deliver answers and save boatloads of time for AAV and other viruses. Stunner quickly delivers answers on titer and empty flow ratio. Big Tuna takes care of buffer exchange and concentration. And UNCLE is the key to all kinds of stability insights. That's exactly what we'll be checking out today for AAV. This is one way to think about AAV. If we think of AAV as a pinata, the DNA is candy and the capsid is cardboard and colored paper, uh, that everyone wants a lot of information about that AAV. Uh, and current analytical methods aren't good enough, but UNCLE helps you know exactly how stable your AAV is and how to help stop aggregation from becoming a problem. So if we keep thinking of AAV as a pinata, then this is what a thermal stability experiment looks like. UNCLE is that broadsword wielding warrior who is wasting no time seeing what this capsid can withstand. Meanwhile, uh, gene therapy researchers are there in the background, uh, cheering on the experiment and excited for the results. So let's learn a little bit about UNCLE. Uh, UNCLE is an all-in-one stability platform ready for AAV. It uses two lasers to excite either label-free capsid protein intrinsic fluorescence or a variety of dye-based fluorescence. We'll actually use both fluorescence methods uh, to look at AAV stability. With full spectrum fluorescence detection, UNCLE can pick up on both sides kinds of those signals, which is really valuable. Uh, SLS is the scattered light from those two lasers and gives information on what aggregates form during, especially during a thermal stability ramp. Uh, DLS is dynamic light scattering and allows for detailed measurements of size and size distribution. Those three detection methods can be operated isothermally or across a heat ramp designed to thermally stress samples and see which ones can take the heat. That means UNCLE is able to deliver results on aggregation and two different looks uh, on viral capsid stability in about two hours with only nine microliters of sample for up to 48 samples at a time. The secret sauce of the UNCLE is the UNI. It's an anodized aluminum frame with 16 quartz cubettes, where each quartz cubette holds nine microliters of sample. So all you do is pipette in your sample and seal the uni inside of its blue frame so silicon seals clip around those little cubettes. Just like that, you have a nicely sealed sample where you don't have to worry about evaporation over long periods of time or over a thermal ramp. Uh, this is also a handy sample holder because you can pop it into, say, a 37 degree incubator and do a weeks or months long stability experiment right in the uni, or you could put it into a freezer and go through freeze thaw cycles also right in that uni. Those are just some advantages to having a well sealed sample holder with such a small sample volume needed. Okay, so coming back to AAV, UNCLE can deliver two different kinds of stability information when it comes to AAV, capsid stability and aggregation. When it comes to capsid stability, UNCLE will use its fluorescence to measure two different behaviors. On top, you see a cartoon of protein unfolding and capsid disruption occurring as a result. Or on the bottom of the left side of the slide, uh, genome ejection can actually occur from mostly intact capsids, uh, sometimes called uh, uncoding, but since this is happening outside of cells, I prefer to call it genome ejection. So we'll look at data both from the literature and from UNCLE to demonstrate those behaviors and investigate them further. On the right side of the slide, 
with, we'll talk about aggregation, which with Uncle's SLS and DLS capabilities, we'll be able to identify when aggregation occurs, which can be at either, either at time zero before an experiment, uh, where you want to check out that your sample is monodisperse, and to know if you should go forward with your experiment. Or with SLS, you can see how aggregation occurs during a thermal ramp as a measure of the colloidal stability of your uh, AAV. So the first question to address usually is, how do we know that AAV capsids have these two different stability options uh, for sort of falling apart, the capsid disruption and the genome ejection pathway? Well, before that, we go to the literature. Uh, here we can see three different morphologies of AAV in an AFM uh, data set done on AAV8 and AAV9. Uh, these AFM images show both behaviors directly. In this case, the AFM data were captured after heating AAV to various temperatures. So at the top, we can see intact capsids as bright circles. And going down the slide to the green boxes, we can see those bright white circles with ejected DNA uh, coming out of each one of them. Uh, the authors of this paper also point out that the length of DNA exiting the capsids is variable, and so that supports the idea uh, that this DNA is in the process of exiting the capsid. On the bottom is compact DNA clusters uh, without those AAV bright white circles or capsids. So this is what uh, would be left behind after complete AAV disruption. So in this one data set, you can see uh, sort of all three states of AAV, both the intact capsid form, the form where it's sort of uh, pseudo-stable and ejecting its linearized DNA, and then the finally totally disrupted pile of DNA form. All right, so to check out capsid stability, UNCLE will make use of the intrinsic fluorescence of the AAV capsid proteins. UNCLE is going to excite those capsid proteins with its 266 nanometer laser, and the tryptophan and tyrosine residues uh, of those proteins will then fluoresce. When those proteins unfold, that fluorescence changes in a few characteristic ways and lets us know unfolding has occurred. Here we have a quick look at the intrinsic fluorescence signal collected by UNCLE on a sample of 1 times 10 to the 13th AAV9 uh, without cybergold. Each line here is uh, a fluorescence read at a different temperature, starting from the top and going to the bottom. As the sample temperature increases, the signal intensity drops and shifts to the right, which is called a redshift. So that blue arrow and dashed line, I'm meant to guide the eye to this redshift by showing you where the true vertical is and then showing you where the, the uh, peak of each of those distributions is. Also note that you can see the SLS signal from both the 266 nanometer and the 473 nanometer lasers uh, on this fluorescence trace. So if we take that same intrinsic fluorescence data, uh, we analyze it to look for the sort of spectral center of mass also called the barycentric mean wavelength or BCM wavelength, uh, we have the data shown in blue. So as you heat up the AAV sample, uh, at a certain point, those proteins start to show that redshift and that BCM wavelength increases. And we can identify the onset temperature for that increase here at 74.2 degrees Celsius and the melting temperature for that unfolding behavior here at 78.6 degrees. At the same time, by tracking the SLS signal from the 266 nanometer laser, we can see aggregation behavior because when AAV is just floating around happily, that SLS signal will be quite stable. But once aggregation has begun, that SLS signal increases. So you can see in green that SLS at 266 signal increases with a TAG or aggregation temperature at 74.5 degrees. So with this one run, we're able to look at both uh, protein capsid unfolding and aggregation through the means of looking at simultaneous fluorescence and SLS. For genome ejection, UNCLE will make use of cybergold dye and it will excite cybergold with its 473 nanometer laser. And the purpose of adding that dye is to detect genome ejection by showing an increase in fluorescence signal. So at the start, cybergold will have a low fluorescence. Well, the genome is inside of the capsid, uh, but any free DNA will show fluorescence. But as the capsid is heated and releases DNA, 
then that fluorescence of cyber gold will increase because the cyber gold dye and the DNA can now interact with each other. The temperature where the dye fluorescence increases will be the stability readout. So here we have a sample of 1 times 10 to the 13th AAB9 with cyber gold, where we can see the dye's fluorescence in a different part of the spectrum from the intrinsic protein fluorescence. So that's between about 500 and 650 nanometers, where that fluorescence signal increase as temperature goes up. Uh, we also see the SLS peak at 473 nanometers. In this experiment, only that 473 nanometer blue laser is used. Uh, so that's why there's no intrinsic fluorescence signal or SLS signal at 266 nanometers. Here's a look at the analysis for that cyber gold fluorescence. Again, we're looking at fluorescence in green, but this time it's the area under the curve. So the headline of this experiment uh, will be that large increase that you see. But let's walk through it from left to right. So starting at room temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, what we first notice is that there's some signal from uh, existing free-floating DNA uh, present with cyber gold dye in our AAV sample. So that's the kind of thing that we can purify out uh, with benzonate step followed by a molecular wave cutoff, uh, buffer exchange or dialysis or running on big tuna. Uh, as temperature increases, what we see is first that cyber gold fluorescence decreases because there's a relationship between temperature and cyber gold fluorescence. Uh, but starting at about 50 degrees Celsius, we see a large increase in fluorescence and an identified melting temperature at about 58 degrees Celsius. So this is that headline of the experiment showing the ejection of viral DNA at those temperatures uh, consistent with uh, literature data uh, that we'll see a little bit uh, forward in the experiment and also with that AFM data that we showed earlier. Simultaneous with this cyber gold fluorescence ejection, uh, we're also looking at the SLS data in blue, and this is showing our uh, aggregation onset, again, really close to 75 degrees Celsius. So with one experiment, we're seeing the amount of DNA that's present at the start of the experiment before any AEV have started to degrade because of temperature. Uh, we're seeing the temperature at which DNA starts to release from our capsids, and we're seeing when uh, aggregation begins by SLS. As we read tons of samples on the uncle, we've noticed that each serotype behaves very differently. So here I've shown uh, a series where we've mixed together uh, empty and full capsids for AV5 on the right and AV9 on the left. Uh, what you can see is a couple of different uh, observations. First, AAV9 shows uh, sort of a, a, a bimodal uh, genome ejection behavior, uh, but that first peak between about 40 and 50 degrees Celsius is rather weak, and then most genome ejection appears to occur between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Contrast that with AAV5, and you see a much more clear uh, behavior where you get a lot of genome ejection occurring between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius, and a little bit less occurring at higher temperatures. You also notice that for both of these samples, as we increase the or as we increase the number of empty capsids or decrease the percent full present in the sample, uh, that the signal coming from cyber gold also decreases, which is what you expect because, hey, there's less DNA present in the sample. If you check out a couple more um, interesting serotypes, you can see the extremes of these uh, aggregation and genome ejection behaviors, where on the left we're looking at php.eb and at the right we're looking at ancient 80. And you'll notice uh, these are, are pretty unique in that they're at extreme ends of the spectrum for the serotypes that we've tested. So with php.eb, uh, the aggregation temperature lines up exactly with the genome ejection temperature. Uh, but with ancient 80, it's actually the largest difference between those two behaviors that we've seen, where there's a 30 degrees Celsius gap between the genome ejection and aggregation behaviors. And importantly, that something that we saw earlier is that that aggregation behavior uh, always syncs up with the protein unfolding behavior uh, from the capsid. So even though we're not looking directly at the protein behavior with this blue laser and cyber gold dye, uh, we can infer where protein unfolding occurs because that will also line up with the onset of aggregation. 
if we want to check out going beyond amino acid sequence and serotypes, uh, we can look at excipients and formulation, where here we're looking at the intrinsic fluorescence and protein unfolding on the left, and the cybergold fluorescence and genome injection on the right. In green, we have a PBS sample, and in blue, we've spiked in arginine into the buffer of that sample. So here, that high concentration arginine spike decreases the protein stability fluorescence uh, by about seven degrees, but actually decreases the genome injection stability by about 13 degrees Celsius. So that tells us a couple of things. Uh, first of all, that formulations do impact both stability behaviors and that they impact those stability behaviors to varying extents. So it's important to measure both stability behaviors, uh, which you can do very nicely and easily on the uncle. Because you can't just look at one and see that it's a seven degree C difference and extrapolate that to the other behavior. It's something that you do need to get both data points independently. Okay, so now we know we can crack open the AV pinata. Let's also take a look at what you can do to change how things come apart uh, with a look, further look at the impact of formulations. So we'll take a quick pit stop in the literature uh, to get something to compare this with. So in this paper by Bennett, uh, a variety of buffers were tested and it's apparent that the choice of buffer uh, has an impact on protein unfolding uh, and AAV stability. So here I'm highlighting AAV serotypes 2, 8, and 9 because we'll check those out on UNCLE a little bit later. In this case, the authors are using uh, a DSF method using cypro orange dye. Uh, that does look specifically at the protein unfolding behavior of AAV capsids. So we'll be comparing our protein intrinsic uh, stability to those different uh, data points uh, shown by Bennett. Okay, so to set this experiment up, what we did was use big tuna to buffer exchange those three serotypes, 2, 8, and 9, uh, into a variety of buffers that spanned a variety of pHs. And we're doing this uh, in a 96 well format plate with a 10 kilodalton molecular weight cutoff filter. So after that buffer exchange, we then read those samples on UNCLE to screen for their impact on capsid stability and genome ejection. So first, let's start with capsid stability and protein unfolding. On the left, we have AAV2, and on the right, we have AAV9. So what we're seeing here is we're checking out exactly when proteins start to unfold in response to, uh, to increased thermal stress. So with AAV2, uh, we're seeing, starting with P, uh, PBS at pH 7.4, uh, the earliest unfolding of those capsid proteins, and then as we get more acidic in our pH, you start to see later and later protein unfolding. And you notice that covers quite a large spread of AAV behavior uh, across temperatures. Meanwhile, on the right side of the slide in AAV9, at those same four pHs, uh, we see unfolding of those proteins at very high temperature, and they're also very closely bunched together. Um, so very different behavior based on AAV serotype. If we plot for our three serotypes, uh, the data where we're looking at different buffers and trying to understand how they behave, what we can see is this relationship between buffer pH and melting temperature of the capsid proteins. And just to the left of each graph, what we can do is again add in that data from Bennett and see that pH is a really nice tool that can take uh, AAV stability across the, the same range of uh, stabilities that Bennett saw in their buffer screen. So this can be one way to start to understand how your AAV might behave once it gets inside of uh, cells and it's inside of a late endosome. Uh, does, do those proteins start to uh, change their stability behavior? And likewise, you can use it to optimize the buffer that they're being stored in to make sure that they're going to hold on to their uh, capsid protein stability as long as possible. Okay, let's shift gears and look at the other half of the equation for genome ejection. And here we're just looking at AAV2 and seeing the impact of uh, different acetate buffers at three different pHs. And you can see at uh, actually more acidic pHs uh, that now we have genome ejection behavior uh, that is sort of more stable, so that's occurring at higher temperatures in those more acidic pHs. And if we kind of wrap everything up uh, in one nice graph, what we can do is check out our AAV2 sample 
and look at various different pHs and see uh, that pH has uh, very interesting effects on on both capsid stability and genome ejection. So by running these samples on Uncle in just a couple of hours, we can get a very complete look at AAV stability and understand how changes in pH uh, impact both our protein unfolding through intrinsic fluorescence and a look at the capsid stability and how it impacts our genome ejection behavior of AAV and understanding when our uh, viral vector might release its DNA into the surrounding environment, uh, which could be useful both in terms of buffer storage and in terms of uh, how it behaves in the late endosome of the cells. And also importantly, I wanna emphasize that this whole experiment took about 24 hours a day of uh, experimental time. So that buffer exchange on Victuna had just a couple of hours and then two rounds on Uncle uh, with one of them overnight and we were done with this whole experiment and data set uh, pretty fast. So from all that Uncle data in the academic literature, we can see that these two different stability behaviors happen at different temperatures with genome ejection actually occurring at temperatures far below capsid disruption. And so this is why measuring viral stability on Uncle is so important. It can look at both of these pieces of data and aggregation too, and understand exactly what's going on with your AAV sample. So with this data, you can hopefully create an AAV that's ready for battle and won't aggregate or fall apart when under stress. Thanks for uh, your kind attention. And now I'll pause and take questions. But if anyone has uh, any other questions they wanna reach out to us, you can find us at info at unchainlabs.com. Thank you, Kevin, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question asks, do different stereotypes have different aggregation behavior? Uh, yes, so definitely, and I would also probably add, uh, definitely. Uh, so if you're looking at aggregation, there's probably two different ways that you can look at that. One is if you just have a sample, you know, bench top, uh, room temperature, and see how quickly that aggregates. And it's something you can very easily check out with DLS. Uh, I know, you know, AAVs one and two are particularly notorious for aggregating uh, quite severely, uh, just at room temperature. And AAV9 is a, another common stereotype that actually is quite stable and tends to not aggregate. And you can get very sharp uh, monodispersed peaks with AAV9. The other way you can look at aggregation is during a thermal ramp by checking out when SLS uh, increases, uh, like we saw in a lot of the data in the presentation today. And that's gonna really stress test the capsid protein stability and going to show exactly when uh, those different capsid proteins uh, unfold and aggregate to kind of get a, a picture of what might happen to the protein as it starts to you know have stability problems in even longer term storage uh, and that will also differ greatly across serotypes as well great thank you this next question asks how would testing thermal stability help me with my process development mm, okay yeah because i think today we spent a lot of time looking at formulation work uh, and talked a little bit about how this can apply to capsid engineering as well uh, when you're looking at process development, uh, I guess what's really important here is I'm thinking of chromatography steps uh, where you have different buffers going through your AAV, you're exposed to different pHs and ionic strengths, uh, and even temperatures as well if you're using uh, uh, heated columns. Uh, so what we saw is across a lot of different buffers and a lot of different pHs, you have varying stabilities. So that might be something when you're considering when you're optimizing your chromatography buffer, especially if you're doing anion exchange chromatography, um, because using the wrong buffer there can really just uh, expose your AAV to a condition where it's not gonna be very stable for very long, uh, especially in the shear stress of a, of a chromatography column. The other thing is when you're using a column heater, um, some of the AAVs that we've been testing in certain buffers can start to show genome ejection as low as 37 degrees Celsius. So if you're heating your column even up to 37 or 40 degrees Celsius, uh, you could be seeing problems with yield uh, just because of what you're doing with your buffer and your AAV. So these kinds of, answering these kinds of questions about stability for your AAV 
really helps you understand what your design space should be when making those types of choices for your process. Great, thank you. All right, this next question asks, can you use UNCLE's DLS when looking at AAV stability? So UNCLE's DLS is typically used uh, before and after a thermal ramp for the experiments that I've shown today. And let's just kind of run automatically uh, as a way of checking what the quality of your sample is before running a thermal ramp uh, and to confirm aggregation uh, through an orthogonal light scattering metric at the end of your thermal ramp. Uh, but you can also just use it as a quick DLS check uh, for a, a low volume DLS system if you just want to see, you know, hey, I'm going to run uh, some other you know, cell-based assay on my AAV, and I want to confirm that my uh, AAV is still nicely monodispersed and not suffering from aggregation. Um, so that's a nice little use of DLS. Uh, UNCLE also is really commonly used for isothermal studies, too. So if you want to check out, um, say, at 37 degrees C, 40, 45, 50, something like that, and look at DLS over several days, uh, this is another good way of checking out uh, stability and aggregation uh, on the UNCLE. All right, and our next question asks, can I do this kind of test if iodixinol is present? Uh, so this is an interesting one. Uh, the result that we didn't really expect when we started testing out these samples, um, if you, the short answer is yes. If you're using CyberGold and you're looking at genome ejection, uh, then you're fine. You're using a blue laser and it excites just that CyberGold result and you see capsid uh, start genome ejection as a result. and, and capsid uh, uh, unfolding can be inferred from the SLS signal. But if you're using UV excitation, uh, iodixinol, you tend to not see any signal at low temperatures, things like room temperature. But then once you start to heat up your sample, uh, you begin to see major iodixinol fluorescence that interferes with that typical tryptophan and tyrosine fluorescence. Uh, so if you're looking at signal just at 300, 330 or 350, um, iodixinol will be fluorescing there if you're using a UV laser to excite it, but it's something you're going to actually miss at room temperature and it will mess up your results uh, at higher temperatures. So yeah, it's a very interesting situation when you start using uh, iodixinol. Great. And we're getting great questions from our audience in here. This next one asks, what are the mechanisms for genome injection before capsid disruption? Uh, so this one's interesting because if you dig into the literature and go try to check out all the biophysical studies, uh, it's not been a totally solved uh, mechanism yet. Uh, what you can see is if you look at different studies and kind of check out different mutation studies, um, it seems to imply that there's uh, genome ejection occurring through one of the axes. Uh, I believe it is the threefold axis, but I, uh, I'd have to double check on that. Um, and it's kind of, it's not something that's really been figured out quite yet. Uh, because it's, you know, the resolution of AFM and other types of uh, microscopy uh, aren't going to be able to, to give you an answer there. Um, so really, you just have to look at kind of mutation studies and seeing where you mutate different parts of the capsid, what is the impact on genome ejection. Uh, and that's not really done, been done in a rigorous way quite yet. Um, but if you sort of start to connect some of the lines, that, that's where I would look at first if I were trying to study the mechanisms, me mechanisms for genome ejection. Is that part of the capsid and the impact of uh, capsid, you know, uh, post-translation modifications and, and amino acid sequences uh, in that region of the capsid? And that also actually goes along with um, length and structure of the genome as well. All right. Next question. Can you see glass transition in the thermal ramp? Uh, so typically what we're talking about when we're talking about protein samples and AAV samples is we'll use the words uh, uh, melting temperature or TM, uh, and that's going to correspond to the protein uh, unfolding temperature. So it's the, the inflection point between a folded and unfolded protein. Um, and then on the genome side of things, uh, that's going to be the, the genome ejection temperature. Um, so if glass transition is referring to something else specific, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly aware of that term. Uh, but yeah, definitely for UV-based uh, protein unfolding, you can see those melting temperatures. And then for cyberbell fluorescence, you can see uh, that DNA behavior as well. 
All right. Next question, what is the AAV concentration required for measurable in, or excuse me, measurement in uncle? Okay, so with cybergold fluorescence, looking at those genome ejection assays, the lower limit is about five times 10 to the 11th uh, VG per mil. It's the kind of thing you can go a little bit lower. Um, it's just the sort of thing where uh, each you know genome is slightly different. So if you have a larger genome, you're gonna have a lower, uh, lower limit of detection. If you have a smaller genome, it'll be a little bit higher. For intrinsic fluorescence, it's about five times 10 to the 12th. Uh, it depends a little bit on sample purity. And then for DLS, it'll be about five times 10 to the 11th again. All right, and it looks like we have time for one more question here. And this last question asks, does this work with self-complementary AAV? Yes, definitely. And that, that's actually one of the really interesting uh, parameters that you can test out and see how it impacts um, uh, CAPS's stability. So I know generally you're going to pick your, your genome based on its functional performance, but having a self-complementary AAV versus a single-stranded uh, AAV genome uh, will impact stability, will change genome injection temperature. Great. Well, thank you again, Kevin, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Unchained Labs, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Bye-bye.